Good morning and welcome to the first plenary talk of the 44th uh, IVM conference. Uh, I have to say that for the organizing committee, it is, it is an honor and a pleasure to introduce you to our plenary speaker of today, who, by the way, needs little introduction, as he's one of the leading scholars in the field of uh, film studies and, in fact, one of its first introducers into the curriculum of English studies in Spain. Uh, Celestino de Leito, full professor of English literature and film at the University of Zaragoza, has a long and extensive teaching and research experience. He has taught graduate and postgraduate courses at the universities of Sheffield, Sevilla and uh, Zaragoza, and his research interests focus on border theory and its film representation, um, cinema and the city, cosmopolitanism and cinema, film theory and history, and also on the relationships between film and literature. Uh, Professor Delato has also published uh, several books on these topics, such as From Tinseltown to Border Town, uh, published in 2016, Alejandro González Iñárritu, published on, uh, in 2010, alongside with Maria del Mar Azcona, The Secret Life of Romantic Comedy, published in 2009, Woody Allen y el Espacio de la Comedia Romántica in that same year, uh, Wayne Wang on 2000, Generic Attractions, New, New Essays on Film Genre and Criticism, also published with Maria del Mar Azcona, Terms of Endearment, Hollywood Romantic Comedy of the 80s and 90s, and also flashbacks rereading the classical uh, Hollywood cinema of 1992. Apart from these monographic studies, we could underscore Professor Delates' numerous articles and book chapters, which have focused also on focalization, on the narrator, and also on metafiction and other aspects of, uh, narrative, of cinematic narrative. Among them, we should mention the highly quoted article for Kalishation in film narrative and other works on culture, ideology and gender, like his articles on Alien 3 and Basic Instinct, without forgetting Professor Delater's impressive work on the genre of romantic comedy, transnational cinemas, border and cosmopolitan theories, global cities, and also with a particular emphasis on social and cinematic space. In addition to this, uh, to all this, Professor Delayta has participated in several funded research projects as research leader, uh, the latest one being, the last one being between Utopia and Armageddon, the space of the cosmopolitan in contemporary cinema, uh, which was um, funded by the Ministry of Economy and uh, Competitividad. Uh, for the period of 2018 to 2021. And uh, as uh, Professor Delates' uh, CV is quite impressive, and I don't want to steal more time from his preliminary talk, I think it shall be best if we directly proceed to his talk, Transnational Stars and the Idea of Europe, Marion Cotillard, Diane Kogar. But before we start, let me remind you that there will be 10 minutes for questions or comments at the end of the talk, and that it's, it is highly important that you keep your microphones off during the talk and that you raise your virtual hands if you want to pose any questions or make any comments for uh, our plenary speaker. Uh, thank you, Celestino, the floor is all yours. Uh, thank you very much. Um... Um, Alfredo, it is of course a great uh, honor uh, for me to be uh, opening this um, IDEAN conference. Uh, I was looking yesterday and uh, it is now 40 years since I uh, went to my first IDEAN conference, which was very near where you are now in my home university in Oviedo in 1981. So it's been a long time, a lot of conferences. And uh, so this is a very uh, special day for me. Thank you uh, to uh, the organizers and to the IDEAN board for uh, inviting me and having me here. I'm, uh, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, can everybody see it? Can everybody see my presentation? Thank you. All right. Uh, so um, some of you may be wondering uh, why I have chosen to discuss two film stars uh, for this talk. Um, uh, the study of film stars, or what's usually referred to as star studies, 
has become one of the most important areas of scholarship research in film studies. Uh, since the, just a second, uh, since the uh, pioneering work of Richard Dyer in the 1970s, we've been aware that film stars are complex repositories of cultural meanings. Stars move from film to film, from specialized magazines to social networks, from, from studio publicity to TV interviews, and gather meanings around the star persona. Cultural constructions formed by all the films in which they appear and all the extra textual materials about them. Since the late 1910s, when the Hollywood studios realized the immense potential of beautiful and charismatic people to attract audiences to the cinemas, the star system has remained a central ingredient of, main, of mainstream cinema all around the world, as much in industrial as in narrative and cultural ways. For more than a century now, we've been fascinated by stars. For more than 40 years, film scholars have incorporated that fascination into their research and their writing. To quote Richard, Richard Dyer at some length, we are fascinated we fascinated by stars because they enact ways of making sense of the experience of being a person in a particular kind of social production, capitalism. With this particular organization of life into public and private spheres, we love them because they represent how we think that experience is or how it would be lovely to feel that it is. Stars represent typical ways of behaving, feeling and thinking in contemporary society, ways that have been socially, culturally, historically constructed. Stars are also embodiments of the social categories in which people are placed and through which they have to make sense of their lives and indeed through which we make our lives. Categories of class, gender, ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, and so on. And all of these typical common ideas that have the feeling of being the air that you breathe, just the way things are, have their own histories, their own peculiarities of social construction." End of quote. In a world that in the course of the last 30 years or so has been changed by global phenomena, transnational exchanges, experiences and identities have proliferated. The cinema itself has undergone a process of transnationalization, both in industrial terms and in terms of the kinds of narratives it tells and the cultural meanings that it constructs. Given stars' continuing centrality in the medium, it's only logical that contemporary stars, particularly some of them, have accumulated some of these meanings of what it is like to live in a transnational world in their persona. Before we continue, since the, term, uh, the, the terms global and transnational have already appeared in my talk, I'd like to discuss the differences between the two, especially when applied to film stars. Global stars represent the culture of globalization in that they have a global reach and offer cultural meanings that may be shared by a great number of people around the planet. They're globally readable and work as powerful points of identification for people all around the world, if not necessarily always with the same meanings. Because of their global reach, they tend to be associated with Hollywood, the only truly global film industry. Transnational stars, on the other hand, represent more localized mobilities and are more explicitly connected with border crossings and with the interplay between two or more national identities. For this reason, they exclude global modes of engagement. Instead, they offer more specialized concrete meanings. As we will see, the same star can be global and transnational at the same time, but if they are, they are so in different ways and for different reasons. Transnational stars crisscross with the global, but they resist the homogeneity associated with it. They highlight the continuing presence of national identities in our experience, but also our growing familiarity with borders, borderlands, and border crossings. They may bear strong marks of national identity as they cross borders and relocate to different geographies, or they may inhabit an in-between territory in which national identities are debilitated. Mario Cotillard and Diane Kruger are both global and transnational stars, but they're so in different ways. They both came to international visibility in the first decade of our century, but their screen personae and their celebrity status was established in the 2010s. 
in different ways, as we shall see, they both articulate meanings that locate them within transnational culture. Sorry. Marion Cotillard. Then. In films since the 1990s, she attained phenomenal success and global star status with La Monde, La Vie en Rose, film from 2007. The film catapulted her across the Atlantic to Hollywood, although uh, by then she had already crossed the ocean twice to appear in Tim Burton's Big Fish in 2003 and Ridley Scott's uncharacteristic romantic comedy A Good Year, 2006. Now her, sorry, her performance as uh, Edith Piaf won her, among other accolades, the first Academy Award in history to Best Actress for a French speaking part. There had been uh, another French uh, um, actress uh, winning the Oscar, but she, uh, the, the part was uh, an English speaking part. This part also cemented her acting method, which critics described as impersonation, immersion, and inner work running counter to the traditional association of the Hollywood star with the predominance of the actor over the part. Jules Sondo argues that she's, a, a, that she's a very French icon whose Frenchness was readable for US audiences. This readability and her adaptability to Hollywood genres facilitated her integration in the Hollywood star system. At the same time, her Hollywood stardom turned her into a national icon in France even an icon of uh, Parisianness, She joined the pantheon of French stars referred to by surname only in France, Pardot, Deneuve, Ajani, Cotillard. Therefore, in her case, the global and the national worked together since her Frenchness became a central part of her global star persona. And yet, even though she continued to work regularly in Hollywood, she hardly ever um, played protagonist parts um, in uh, uh, US films, with the exception perhaps of The Immigrant, 2013, and Allied, 2016. For the rest, she's played mostly secondary parts that rely heavily on French and or female stereotypes, like her two blockbusters of the uh, 2010s, Inception and uh, The Dark Knight Rises. It's symptomatic that in the latter, The Dark Knight Rises, her character Miranda, pales in comparison with that of Catwoman, played by fellow Hollywood star, but homegrown and Hathaway. It's as if her stardom highlighted most in magazines, TV shows, fashion icon appearances, and even music videos, hasn't really translated into the global cinema screens. Apart from the two films mentioned before, um, we could perhaps single out her glamour and humor in Woody Allen's Midnight in Paris, 2011, and uh, her moving understated performance in the multi-protagonist Contagion 2011 too, a film that uh, those of you who have seen uh, know in many ways forecast uh, COVID-19 almost 10 years before. For the rest, her most complex roles of the decade have come from films produced elsewhere in France, uh, Le Petit Mouchoir and the Ouille Edo, among others in Belgium, De Jour et Nuit, in the UK, Macbeth, and in Canada, Juste la fin du monde. Jeanette Vincendo wonders whether there are two Cotillards, the American celebrity and the French actor. Vincendo explains that an important reason for her access to a global dimension is her proficiency in the use of English. This is linked to her engagement with intercultural communication, cosmopolitan attitudes, and border crossings. Excuse me. Allied shows her ability to cross borders and navigate between cultures, but it isn't just her English, but the panoply of different languages and accents that she activates in her films that define her transnational dimension as a star. For instance, in Blood Ties, 2013, she plays Italian-American prostitute Monica. Even though Cotilla reportedly couldn't speak the language, Italian, it was a choice to make a character Italian. In the film, she's equally effective when she speaks Italian as when she speaks English with an Italian New York accent. In The Immigrant, she's Polish, which she apparently speaks with a faint German accent because her character Eva comes from Silesia. 
this is part uh, um, this is part of her approach to her of her thorough approach to her job but in cultural terms it translates into a performance of respect for diversity and a strong desire to make the other visible and human particularly in an environment in an environment like the film industry which has often reduced foreigners and migrants to demeaning stereotypes an insignificant detail in the otherwise forgettable Assassin's Creed 2016 gives a measure of uh, this attitude. Her character Sofia pronounces Andalusia, where part of the action takes place in perfect Spanish, whereas her father, played by Jeremy Irons, doesn't even bother, says Andalusia or something. Not easily noticeable and certainly not part of the story, this little touch speaks about her approach to linguistic and cultural diversity to highlighting instead of homogenizing difference. This ethical commitment to acknowledging the other, both as complex and as different, may be linked with another common feature of her characters, their compassion. In Macbeth, her Lady Macbeth is not only ruthless and ambitious, but also empathetic and intensely sensitive. In Juste la fin du monde, her character Catherine is often framed in close-ups that highlight her eyes, through which she transmits boundless sympathy and understanding towards the members of the extremely dysfunctional family to whom she's linked by marriage to one of the sons. The diversity of her linguistic registers extends to her French-speaking roles. In the comedy uh, Rock and Roll, 2017, she plays Marion, married to Guillaume, played by her uh, partner in real life, Guillaume Canet, uh, and therefore they are a parody of the real life couple. She spends much of the first part of the film speaking to her family with a French Canadian accent, although of course they are French and they live in Paris, in preparation for the shoot of her next film in Canada. This, like other elements of the film's plot, is a parody of her by then famous acting method. When she comes back from the shoot, She's dropped her Canadian accent and she complains about the directors, the film director's decision to have the actors speak with their own accent, but with a Canadian accent. This is a direct reference to Juste la fin du monde, a film that was central uh, to her career. But uh, I want to focus briefly on her starring part in Deux jours une nuit, the film directed by the Darden brothers. Uh, Jean-Pierre and Luc Darden universally acknowledged as members of the most ex exclusive pantheon of 21st century European auteur, are in the words of critic uh, A.O. Scott, uh, quote, faithful chroniclers of a European working class in crisis, unquote. Their working method includes, with a few exceptions, working with non-professional actors, uh, with non-professional actors. In this context, the presence of, in the film of Cotillard, at the time one of the most popular uh, European stars, is exceptional in the brothers' oeuvre. For her part as Sandra, a factory worker who's about to lose her job because her workmates have voted that she is sacked rather than lose a bonus, Cotillard takes off her star mantle and adapts her acting to the Darden naturalistic requirements to convey not only the fragility that is the consequences of post-crisis precarity, but also a stunning other projection that leads her to constantly empathize with those that have decided to take a job away uh, from her. Let me see if I can. Um, can you see this? We can see it, but you, you have to activate audio. Just a second. First. Okay. okay. Yeah, you told me you, they did mention. Okay. Allô, Kader Oui, c'est Sandra. Oui, ça va, oui. Oui, oui, la forme. 
Robert m'a dit que je pouvais t'appeler. Je te dérange pas. C'est à propos du vote. J'ai vu Dumont avec euh, Juliette et il est d'accord qu'on revote lundi matin. Allez, Robert t'a dit Et... Alors... Euh, je voulais te demander si t'étais d'accord que je reste. Oui, je sais. C'est pas toi qui décides, mais... Tu comprends Je veux pas te faire perdre mille euros. Et... Je veux juste te dire que... Attends, une seconde, hein. Je veux juste te dire que je voudrais que tu votes pour moi, pour que je garde mon travail. J'ai besoin de mon salaire, on en a besoin à la maison. Refuser de voter, c'est... Ce sera pas suffisant. Ce qu'il faudrait, c'est... C'est que tu acceptes de perdre ta prime. Mais je veux pas te forcer. Je sais que 1000 euros, t'en as aussi besoin. C'est vrai Oh, Kader. Je te remercie. Ta gentillesse, je... Merci, merci. Oui, oui. Bon week-end à toi aussi. Oui, oui. À lundi matin. Merci. Allez, au revoir. Just a second. Okay, so all that I'm kind of juggling a thousand screens at the same time. Um, the very feel the, fe the very firm sense of locatedness provided that the, by the Dardenne habitual space, the industrial areas of Serran, the, their hometown in southern Belgium, highlights that the film tells a transnational European story about the victims of savage neoliberalism. She honors the geography of the film by expanding her linguistic versatility to the slight Belgian working class accent of protagonist Sandra. The character's empathy also resonates with the transnational issues mentioned before, attention to geographical specificities, acknowledgement of inequalities, and the desire to forge connections across borders through recognition and uh, foregrounding of the other's difference. Cotillard parts as a uh, part as Sandra speaks to a dimension of contemporary European and uh, sorry of contemporary Europe and the bumpy process of European integration that often remains under the radar. She represents an extreme form of solidarity and an easy tolerance of diversity and otherness, even when, as in deux jours une nuit, her job is on the line. For Sandra, the cosmopolitan values of openness, equality of rights and compassion are a given 
and yet she becomes the victim of the dominant form of neoliberalism endorsed by the policymakers in the union and ratified by many of its laws. <clears throat> The attention to diversity that has become an important ingredient of a star persona on both sides of the Atlantic is not explicitly exploited in the narrative, but it's at the bottom of her unusual form of courage. Therefore, in her encounter with the Darden world, she becomes a potent signifier of both the most utopian aspects of the European project, as well as the grim realities of its crisis. And now on to uh, Diane Kruger. Marion Cotillard's Frenchness is compatible, indeed an important part of a transnational dimension, which as we've seen concern, concerns both repeated transatlantic crossings, both with the US and Canada, and the dream of a borderless Europe. The case of Diane Kruger is different. She was born in Germany, educated in London. She started and has spent much of her film career in France and is a US citizen. Her name, may be pronounced as uh, Diane Kruger in German, Diane Kruger in French, or Diane Kruger in English, depending on the circumstances. Less visible as a star than Cotillard, it may be argued that, sorry, that uh, that invisibility is a crucial ingredient of a star persona and defines her as a citizen of the border. Kruger came to international attention playing Helen of Troy in the epic blockbuster Troy, 2004, alongside stars Brad Pitt, Orlando Bloom, and Eric Banner. The film, Troy, does little to change the classical view of the mythological character of uh, Helen as a, a blank recipient of male desire, the traditional object of exchange between men in which the object itself matters little. Kruger was a model when she started her film career, and like Cotillard remained an occasional model. In fact, her modeling seems to have often predominated over her acting in public perception. Helen of Troy's generic beauty became attached to the model's generic beauty as the actor's trajectory continued to be marked by their genericity, even the lack of charisma often associated with models. In many of her films, she has a translucid quality that's not only the consequence of her embodiment of traditional notions of white femininity, but often coincides with the absence of strong marks of national identity. In Troy, uh, heroes and secondary characters, including the other women, are firmly, uh, firmly anchored in national identities. Menelaus of Sparta, Paris and Hector of Troy, Pythian Achilles. Helen, however, takes, takes on the national identity first of her husband as Helen of Sparta, and then of her lover as Helen of Troy. Born according to the Iliad and the Odyssey of Zeus and Leda, she has no country. It seems fit that the filmmakers chose for the part uh, of Helen, the little known actor that seemed to be from no place in particular. Much later, referring to her part in the TV series, The Bridge, 2013-14, critic Janet McCabe describes her and the heroines of the original Danish-Swedish series, Bronn, and the uh, later Franco-British spin-off, The Tunnel. Uh, so she describes the three um, actors with their flaxen hair and flowing locks, fragile and unflinching, familiar yet enigmatic as figures of the border. As Kruger's career developed and transnational by default parts proliferated, this borderliness became an essential part of a star persona and approximated Kruger to Song Wilim's description of transnational, of, of certain transnational uh, cinematic phenomena that don't arise from any single country and therefore, uh, in fact, erase the national. In the course of the 2010s, Kruger became a signifier of the intensification of the transnational term in cinema. Let me just run through some of her parts in the 2010s. In National Treasure, uh, same year as Troy, so this is a bit earlier, uh, she is and sounds American, but with a Saxony German accent. In Wicker Park, she has a Czech mother and a Californian father. In Frankie, she's a model who was born in Germany and lives in Paris, speaks German to her mother on the phone and French or English in the shoots. She's a Russian princess turned anarchist who speaks perfect French in Le Brigade du Tigre, 
Austrian, although the film is spoken entirely in English in copying Beethoven, South African speaking English with a South African accent in Goodbye Bafana, and from nowhere at all, since she is a figment of the male protagonist's imagination, a ghost that speaks both French and English in L'Age de Tenebre, Canadian film. In The Hunting Party, she's a member of a Serbo-Bosnian militia and speaks English with a strong accent from the Balkans, as she does in Unknown as a Bosnian migrant in Berlin. She's a German film star in Inglorious Bastards, speaking English with a German accent, and Austrian princess uh, Marie Antoinette in Les Adieux à la Reine. She's an alien in The Host and a caricatured Bavarian psychotherapist who manages in a brief cameo appearance to speak in German, French and English with a German accent in Le Garçon et Guillaume à Table. In Maryland, she is German, uh, lives in the Côte d'Azur, says home is London, and flies to Canada when she has to find a new home. In Tout nous sépare, she was also born in Germany, but is French and she's a Belgian witch with a German accent in her cameo appearance in Welcome to, Mar to Marwan. To end the decade in the operative, her character Rachel was born in London of a British Jewish father who hated Israel and a German mother who went to live in a kibbutz in Israel. She then lived in Canada for a while and is now living in Germany, but working for Israel. In general, her persona is characterized by vertiginous border crossings and, like Cotillard, by her alternation between Hollywood and Europe. In the meantime, her acting style has evolved into a minimalist intensity that has made the most of her invisibility and her cultural iconicity as always a foreign woman without a country. Excuse me. Her part in The Bridge, as a socially awkward but brilliant police detective living in El Paso and constantly crossing the border between Mexico and the US, showcased and consolidated her iconicity as a woman of the border. But I want to focus here on, the other, on her other great part of the 2010s, Aus dem Nichts uh, in the Fade, a film from 2017, which was her first and so far, uh, incredibly, uh, her only German film, but the one for which she was unanim unanimously praised for her performance and received her first major recognition with the Cannes Palme d'Or. As in the bridge, an important part of this performance is related to her whiteness. In the DVD extras, director Fatih Akin explains that he wanted a very Aryan looking woman for his heroine, underlining that her whiteness is ideological. It becomes part of a white canvas, which although centered in Hamburg, uh, where German Katia um, um, Diane Kruger lives with her Kurdish Turkish husband Nuri and their son Rocco, extends to southeastern Turkey, where Nuri and his family are from, and Greece, where the film's final act takes part. This is a map of Europe marked by the inability of many people to see and operate beyond extremely racialized forms of nationalism, but also by the willingness of a few to incorporate into their very personal experience the idea of a transnational Europe. In Akin's film, it's Kruger's immaculate Aryan credentials, her shining white appearance, that make her trajectory more visible and her decisions more compelling, as well as more tragic. After the early deaths of her husband and son in a terrorist attack by a neo-Nazi group in Hamburg, only she understands straight away uh, who the authors of the attacks have been while the police follow a racist logic in their investigation. The intensity and narrative pervasiveness of her inner distress at the loss of her loved ones and her anger at the structural racism which is mortally wounding the European project that she's made her own make her transnationalism impossible to ignore for the spectator. She's all we have to look at in the story. And given the actor's translucid persona, it's particularly uncomfortable to look. Uh, but Kruger's performance in this film goes beyond iconicity and she uh, as she plunges the depths of her own identity. This is illustrated in two close-ups in the final section. After the young terrorist couple have been acquitted by the German court, she follows them to Greece, where they, where they have fled seeking the protection of the neo-Nazi Greek group uh, Golden Dawn. 
Katia's bent on revenge has built a homemade bomb, has planted it in the trailer by the beach where the couple are staying and is waiting for their return to explode it, hiding behind a bush. We're going to uh, watch this clip uh, in, two, in, in two parts. Just a second. Can you see this? I think that we're just um, seeing your notes on the presentation. I think you've got to okay. choose the, the video. Sorry about this. It's no good by using my notes. Um, you have to share just yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this, no, not the whole screen. Is that it now? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay. We're back to the presentation now? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry, but I can kind of get lost with all this, this proliferation of screens. So the close-up uh, of uh, Diane Kruger as Katia conveys her gradual realization that in consummating her plan of planting the bomb and uh, taking revenge on the, on the two people who killed her family, she'll be betraying the transnational rationale of her own identity and therefore will also be betraying the memory of her hybrid family. The piercing and subtly changing expressiveness of her eyes narrates her change of mind as she retrieves the bomb before the murderers arrive. Immediately after, we find her sitting outside her rented house, more relaxed, looking out at the sea. 
I'm going to share the end of the clip. Uh, in the film, uh, uh, Katia ha ha has stopped her having her period uh, when um, her um, husband and son died. Here, the camera, this is a few months later, the camera follows her gaze down as her hand goes inside the trousers and she realizes that for the first time since the terrorist attack, her period has come. The camera tilts up to focus on her face again, which now conveys in her minimalist style the understanding that she can't allow herself to, re to return to the normality signified by her period. Without her hybrid family, the transnational citizen is nothing. Just as without tolerance and solidarity, Europe, like the English title of the film, in the fade, fades. For Katia, there's no way back. Aus dem Nichts represents a culmination of sorts for Diane Kruger, who here manages to make her early anonymity the very core of a strong form of identity and in the process confirms the cultural relevance of the radical form of transnationalism that she represents. The marginal identity takes center stage in this film. In the DVD extras, Kruger asserts that the story is about grief and that any other form of unbearable loss would have done uh, just the same. But in the film, this grief has a specific environment, which I would describe as the fall of Europe as a transnational project. This brings us back to Cotillard and De Jure in Nuit, and more generally to the cultural relevance and historicity of stars and star discourses. These two films, like uh, other films in their respective careers, exploit the transnational dimension of Kruger and Cotillard as stars. In both cases, the transnationalism is used to construct narratives about contemporary Europe, the dreams and limitations, the hopes and disappointments attendant on the European project. Both actors play parts that embody what we might call the dream of Europe. Sondra's casual performance of solidarity, compassion and deep-rooted belief in hybridity, even when it works against her own interests, and Katia's choice of hybridity as a way of being European of being human. In both cases, their personification of cosmopolitan values is set against the strong forces of neoliberalism, racism, and hate of the other. The transnational pedigree, the two stars transnational pedigree, is used by the films which, show, which showcase them as potent and complex icons of the cultural and ideological forces that determine the lives, the hopes and frustrations of millions of European people. In their uniqueness and their radiance, stars are not only part of our lives, but can also become signifiers of our social identity and of geopolitical realities. And that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>